Welcome to the Natasha Helfer Podcast. To help keep this podcast going, please consider donating at natashahelfer.com and share this episode. You can find Natasha on Facebook at Natasha Helfer, LCMFT, CSTS, and at Natasha Helfer MFT on Instagram and TikTok. You can find all her cool resources at natashahelfer.com. The intro and outro music for this episode is by Otter Creek. This podcast was edited by Ashley Pacini. Everybody, this is Natasha Helfer. I'm a relational and sex therapist, and this is my podcast where we try to attack shame and get healthier through education, stories, and relationships. And I am just thrilled to have Cami Hurst with me today. We've had kind of a fairly long-term relationship, I would say, over the last few years. Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> contacting each other, and and Cami is a licensed therapist in a private practice in Meridian, Idaho. She is a newly ASECT certified sex therapist, which is super exciting. For those of you who don't know, that's a big deal. It takes a long time <laughs> to get to your ASEC certification. <laughs> and she just completed her doctoral work in clinical sexology, which is really exciting. She's also one of the founders of the Idaho Sexual Health Professionals Association. And she podcasts with a podcast called Sex Therapy 101, which you've interviewed me on that. We yeah. There, you know, this is all kind of like, <laughs> friendly back and forth. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And what I am so flipping excited to talk to you about today is your research, which just falls right in line with what I would say is pretty much my entire professional career. Oh, I know, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. You were looking at research specifically, looking at outcomes for women. And we're going to say right off the bat, this is people who identified as cisgender and identified as women, most of which I believe identified as heterosexual and found themselves in heterosexual relationships and long-term relationships, mostly marriages. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so her research is looking at the outcomes of women, these women who consent to unwanted sex in long-term relationships. And what's the effect of that? Does it affect things like sexual desire or trauma or the relationship itself? So Mm -hmm. we're very excited to talk about that. I remember right when I helped you try to get people to answer this. Mm-hmm. You ran into problems right off the get-go. <laughs> so let's, maybe, let's maybe start there. I, I think we tried to explain this in the last podcast we did together, but let's spend a little bit of time. Some, sometimes it's difficult to think, okay, if it's unwanted sex, doesn't that mean it's sexual assault or rape or some type of sexual abuse? And so people had a hard time saying, how am I supposed to answer this survey if you're looking for people who have not had a history of sexual abuse, but then we're looking at unwanted sex. So can you say a little bit about that and what that's like for you to come up with those parameters? Yeah. Um, I mean, this research definitely were like, this is my whole career. Yeah. I think most practitioners would have an experience with a woman who's saying, I would be perfectly fine, never, ever having sex again. And this is really looking at that. How do we get there? Um, And so you helped me, my N was 1300 women. My goal was a thousand. And I know that I hit that goal because Natasha Helfer helped me (laughs) by publicizing. And we had a fantastic sample size. Everyone has been thrilled with this sample size. So thank you. And that was really an interesting part of advertising this um, academic research on social media, because we got to see that feedback of, wait a minute, what do you mean? And frankly, that's been one of the criticisms of a lot of the non-consensual research is they're wondering if sexual victimization is overrepresented because the words unwanted and unconsensual are intermingled or used interchangeably. Um, What we're talking about here is, no, that was clearly consensual. Somebody said yes, but internally didn't have desire, weren't really wanting to, weren't in the mood. And we can't hold all partners accountable for information that was withheld. It is non-criminal to, if you had a yes from a partner, but did we're not able to discern their inner world, that is not a criminal act. And so we're really wanting to separate the criminality from things that are just not helpful. There are many things that are harmful that are not necessarily criminal criminal, 
People can have sexual trauma without there necessarily being a perpetrator or an instigator, an individual. So those are some of the ideas we had to tackle right off the bat is, and all of these participants, you know, that was the one thing that was clear to them is they did understand that the women, that the sex they were having was consensual and they felt internally like the sex was often unwanted, or they could at least remember one or two or three times where that was the case, even if it wasn't really habitual. Right. Okay. So, so yeah. So, and, and why was it important to have the survey respondents not have a history of sexual abuse? Because that was something that I think was upsetting to some people. Who it was, to- there was some, some comments about, well, this is victim erasure or things like that. And um, the point of requesting all participants not have a history of sexual violence or sexual abuse was so that we could measure the actual impact of consenting to unwanted sex without having these red herrings of, um, because we have the data, we know what sexual abuse and sexual violence do to a woman's desire. We know what it does to their psyche. We have that information. We don't have information about what's harmful when it's consensual. And so, you know, whenever you make something public, you run the risk of being misunderstood. And it was hard not to correct, hey, wait, wait, this is not victim erasure. It's we know we have that information, but we don't have this other information about what if something else is traumatic, but it's consensual. And we really needed to make sure that we were accurately measuring the correct dynamic. I did not want, I have no interest in proposing findings that are murky or maybe colluded with other um, known symptomology from a different source. Right. And that's what sometimes can be difficult to understand from like a research or Mm -hmm. statistics perspective is that if you had included people with sexual trauma, then now all of a sudden these results, people would have said, well, but are they really because of that? Inconclusive. Because of, you know, prior sexual trauma. And so We wanted, I think you want, you wanted to be very clear as to where the symptoms were coming from, Yeah, uh, which is, yeah, it's unfortunate. I think it is an unfortunate thing, but it's just one of those things where you're trying to just get as much possible data to be tied to only one potential thing, which is difficult in humans anyway, but that's (laughs) what I think we're trying to do. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. This was an academic exercise for sure. Yes. Okay. So So yeah, so you're saying two things were very clear from this study, and I agree anecdotally, this has been my experience definitely as a marriage and sex therapist, that there are a lot of women who feel as though there's the sex that they are agreeing to is very much consensual. They would even many times obviously say that their partners are having sex with are people they love and have, Mm -hmm. you know, high esteem for and Mm -hmm. care for. And that they also felt that some of this sexual activity they were agreeing to was not necessarily something they personally wanted or desired. So that's Mm -hmm. what we're looking at. And you're calling this consent to unwanted sex with the acronym CUS, which is CUS, which kind of makes me laugh a little bit. (laughs) I didn't ever think about that. (laughs) I know the whole thing makes me want to cuss. Makes me want to cuss. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> that's a, a topic for another day <laughs> and I didn't coin that some other researchers who've looked at consensual unwanted sex use the CUS acronym but they've never looked at women they've only looked at um, a college type cohort and so this was the first time this research was done looking at adult women in long-term relationships not looking at co-eds in um, casual relationships right which is also important that a lot of people don't realize a lot of the research that's had everywhere is on college Mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. They're they're willing participants for extra credit, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Anyways, that's important. All right. So the relevance of this, which I also think is very important that you mentioned is, I mean, why does this matter? Why is this important when a couple comes into marriage or sex therapy and they're talking about, you know, maybe low desire in particularly in the female's experience, oftentimes therapists are trained to think, well, what's interfering here? You know, is it past sexual trauma? Is it, you know, just low biological desire? Is there something wrong with the hormones, you know, like, et cetera, et cetera. And if this, if this particular cause isn't understood, 
you can miss a a correct assessment, which of course then affects appropriate and effective treatment. Yes? Yeah, yeah, the relevance really is, you know, if we are using, well, we'll get there, I guess, when we come to the um, conclusions, but to assume that all of the common female desire interventions are gonna work for every type of woman that's just really short-sighted because we need to know the cause of the symptomology rather than thinking, Hey, X causes, you know, X treats this symptomology. And there are a lot of common desire interventions. Like we're trained to take a biopsychosocial, right? So we're looking at biologically what's happening, psychologically, what's happening, sociologically, what's happening. And, um, this is something that I think is going to really impact our assessment of low desire and our treatment of low desire. I really um, think that this knowledge is um, going to change how we address low desire in women. I agree. Can you quickly go over who exactly was in the survey as far as age and longevity of relationships, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there were some requirements. Survey participants had to um, confirm these um, specific characteristics, one that they were adult women over 30, that they um, did not have a history of sexual abuse, assault, or violence, that they spoke fluent English, um, that they resided in the U.S. These are all just things of me trying to really zero in and be like, this isn't a cultural thing, this isn't a generational thing, this isn't a result of abuse. I mean, really narrowing down that they had consensual unwanted sex in the current of their long-term relationship um, and that they'd been in a relationship longer than in that relationship longer than three years. That was to just establish that it was a long-term relationship that the luminance uh, phase wasn't at play here, you know, because there's that common drop-off in desire after six to two years. So the, these requirements were all just me trying to like close doors and windows, batten down the hatches and make sure that our data really spoke to what we wanted it to assess, you know? Right. That's six months to two years, I think is what you meant to say. So yes. And then yeah. so by adult women, you meant adult women over the age of 30. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you had six different hypotheses, um, <laughs> which is a lot. <laughs> it is a lot, <laughs> but I all good. And so I'd like to kind of go through each one of those, not necessarily right now all at once, but let's just go through kind of each one, because I think that will give the audience a really good view of, of kind of what the results were, what you, what you were thinking you would find, et cetera. So yeah. why don't we start with kind of hypothesis one? What, what was your first hypothesis? What did you think you would find? So we were looking at, we wanted to establish the different areas are of outcomes, our psychological outcomes, the emotional outcomes, the sexual outcomes. So the hypothesis one was we believed that we'd find that there's a significant minority of women who experience high levels of distress due to long-term pattern of consenting to unwanted sex. Basically, we thought, I bet it upsets women that there's some emotional disturbance. I bet there's some emotional outcomes for consenting to unwanted sex. And, um, this survey was a conglomeration of already validated assessments. So I did not, I was not interested in having to validate my own questions that I was writing. And so if anybody in academia then understands, oh, okay, I chose pre-validated assessments that would tell me this thing. Um, and um, before we asked, what's it feel like before, during, and after? What's the emotional outcome when you consent to unwanted sex? I knew that we needed to assess for unrecognized coercion, meaning these women stated they did not have a history of sexual violence or sexual assault or sexual abuse. However, that's only one portion of coercion. Physical coercion is only one segment of coercion. Um, Verbal and emotional coercion also exist. And we wanted to know, make sure that we weren't missing that piece that this, we didn't want to measure coercive experiences that the women didn't recognize were coercive. So we used a post-refusal sexual persistence scale, things like, um, and what we found was like 31% of women said their partner often or always tried to talk them into it after they said no. 25% said their partner often or always continued to touch or kiss them after they said no. 10% 
Um, so their partner often or always removed some of their clothing and hoped to arouse them after they said no. You know, so very, very little physical coercion, but we've got um, the presence of some verbal and emotional coercion happening. So for all of the six hypotheses, we ran the scale against those who had high levels of verbal coercion and those who had low levels of verbal coercion to make sure we were really measuring this accurately. So, and just to be clear, these people who were answering the survey did not necessarily see these behaviors as coercive, which again, coercion sounds like this big, scary word, you know, like if you're, if you're, if you're exploiting or coercing some coercing somebody, it feels like, oh, this is what happens in like, I mean, not to be minimalistic or something, but, you know, sex trafficking, this is what happens, in, you know, criminal types of scenarios. And, and I often tell my couples, like, we use coercion in, in mm-hmm. run-of-the-mill marriage all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, just, you know, kind of a basic guilt trip or, you know, using kind of power that you don't sometimes even re- recognize you have can definitely be a thing. So uh, some people might call it, you know, negotiation, meeting in the middle. Um, we were really looking at like, once you've said no, what does your partner try to do to change your mind? Right. Which and this is a probably a, another topic altogether, but I do think that especially in heterosexual gender roles, that's been an old age old message that I think both men and women have been socialized to think is normative that men are going to push or be aggressors in sexual initiation. Mm-hmm. And so some of this is seen as like culturally normative, which is mm-hmm. a whole other problematic thing we need to mm-hmm. kind of address. So Yeah, so we were happily surprised to see that for all six hypotheses, when we account for unrecognized coercion, um, the outcomes for those who experience unrecognized coercion, they're a little bit higher, but they're not the whole story. So it was very satisfying to see, okay, we are measuring the outcomes of consenting to unwanted sex when coercion is present. It's a few degrees more intense, but it is still present even without the even verbal without coercion. coercion. Yes. Right. Right. So that was right. the first thing that we needed to establish, you know, and right. then um, we used an assessment to ask about the emotional, um, the emotional state before, during, and after consenting to unwanted sex. We asked it twice. We said, in the most distressing experience, what do you feel? And the least distressing experience, what do you feel? And um, from the most distressing to the least distressing dropped about 24 points, but the most common emotions felt were feeling um, upset, irritable, distressed, high alert, guilty, ashamed, nervous, jittery, hostile. Women, when they consent to unwanted sex, feel these ways before, during, and after. Not what we really want to be feeling before, during, and after a satisfying sexual experience. Oh, that doesn't sound very sexy to me at all. But. No, no. And I tried to incorporate a lot of these um, quotes from participants. I don't know if there's some of these that you're seeing that you want to read in regards to coercion or the emotional outcomes. Yeah, I Um, think that these are really important because these show like, for example, um, participant 86 says he was never coercive, only pouty mm -hmm. and mad at me. It was easier to consent than to deal with his emotions. So this is kind of classic what we were talking about that, of course, he's not coercive. He's my loving husband, right? Mm -hmm. He only gets pouty Mm -hmm. and mad when I don't offer up my vagina. So Mm -hmm. it's like, (laughs) Mm -hmm. and so it's, and, and I think these are the kinds of things that couples sometimes don't realize, no, this is, this is inappropriate behavior. You know, this Mm -hmm. is something we probably really need to address and something even more, you know, like here's one participant, 176. One time I had a UTI, I tried to say no multiple times, but we were on vacation. So even though it hurt and cried, I let him I could have said no more, but I figured if he didn't listen the first two times and he can see my physical responses being, you know, crying intense and still kept going, his needs must be greater than mine. And this is where I want to pause just a minute in the coercive kind of idea, 
I think that our culture is coercive, especially mm -hmm. of high demand and conservative religious backgrounds, mm -hmm. uh, where you have this idea that a, a female partner is, is kind of responsible or has the duty to keep her husband satisfied, mm -hmm. which I think is pretty common in a lot of these types of, of backgrounds. That yeah, can, that showed up in hypothesis have, six. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can have a male partner who isn't necessarily coercive themselves, but I think that overall, I mean, these, these the ideas system. Are coming from some, the system is coercive. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I tried as much in my dissertation and um, in the book that will emerge from this to use these quotes and highlight the voices and the personal experiences of these women. And um, they're really powerful. They're much more powerful, I think, than the graphs and the numbers. <laughs> Um, but we found, yeah, that, you know, hypothesis one was confirmed. Um, and even when we account for unrecognized coercion, it was actually a majority of women, not a minority of women who experience negative emotional outcomes from both their least distressing and most distressing event of consenting to unwanted sex. So, um, that's where we landed with hypothesis one. It was more prevalent than I actually assumed. Right. Yes. And, and, and if you don't mind, I'll keep reading some of these. Of course, you're mm -hmm. welcome to read your own. <laughs> Partic no, I yeah. Participant 170 says it feels easier to cope with, to just have sex and know that I will have a day or a few days of peace where I don't have to worry about his advances because we have already done that recently. Mm -hmm. The feelings of anxiousness have progressively gotten worse over the years. Mm -hmm. Participant 183 says, I feel like I can't be in my own bedroom without feeling nervous and dreading that he will start touching me in expectation of sex. So these are some of the many quotes that were gathered. About the emotional impact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So hypothesis one confirmed and confirmed at a higher level than you had anticipated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hypothesis two then. Yeah, hypothesis two is we believed that some women who consent to unwanted sex in their long-term relationships would confirm the presence of PTSD-like symptoms. So this is looking at what's the psychological effect. And we used a common um, situational PTSD assessment to gather this data. And, you know, it was just really interesting that to see the most common PTSD like symptoms. So I'm not saying this meets the criteria. I'm not diagnosing. I'm just saying here's this grouping of symptoms that we need to take seriously. And 52%, uh, you know, avoided talking about or thinking about the stressful experience, sex. 42% um, feeling very upset when something reminds them of it. 36% feeling irritable and having some angry outbursts. The last symptom to show up, it wasn't common to have repeated disturbing dreams about the stressful experience. The It's showing up much more in anxiety, avoidance, and acquired aversion is the most common symptom, PTSD-like symptoms, the women who are consenting to unwanted sex experience. And when we scored this assessment with our participants, we found just this crazy stratification that, okay, 39% had no severity. Awesome. Um, but 53% had a moderate to high severity of PTSD-like symptoms from consenting to unwanted sex. Wow. Much higher. I thought we were going to find this minority where it's really acute and that these are the people I'm seeing in my offices, these rare off the bell curve instances. And I'm like, oh my gosh, no, I'm not seeing the rare cases. I'm seeing the majority cases. 53% of our survey population had moderate to high severity of PTSD symptoms as an out, a direct outcome of consenting to unwanted sex long-term. Yes. Yes. And this is not, I mean, I'm saying, wow, <laughs> I'm, I am not surprised. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, think mm -hmm. about, and, and, and a way I talk to my clients about this is that like parts of your brain know you're married and want to keep the peace or whatever yeah. your vagina could care less, right? Yeah. Your vagina does not know it's married. It doesn't know whether or not you love a person. All it knows is 
am I having a good time? And do I want to be here? You know? (laughs) And so if you think about your body, then being placed in a space where it doesn't feel comfortable or safe, and it's, you, you can just assume over time, it makes sense. You know, your body becomes more and more tense, more and more anticipatory of, of stress or pain or worry. And so what's happening to your, to your body and to your mm. vagina, to your muscles are all contracting. I mean, when I'm tense, my shoulders go up, right? My mm-hmm. heart rate increases. These are not the types of physiological responses that we want in order to invite desire. And if you're doing this long-term, that becomes kind of a trained response. Yeah. It's negative conditioning really, you know, and these participants are saying, you know, I feel like I have trauma now because of this. I feel aversion to sexual activity. I now have an aversion to being touched. Um, I do things to avoid my partner, like go to bed super late or super early. Um, I avoid him when he's at home with me alone. So we don't have to have sex. I avoid vacations because there's a higher sexual expectation. You know, the outcomes the most are this uh, sexual avoidance, sexual anxiety, and a developed sexual aversion. It's really what we're seeing happen that are showing up as PTSD like symptoms for this situation. Yeah, exactly. And I want to go back just really quickly, just because I'm reading a comment by Holly Bryant, who says, I feel like there's even more nuance to the unwanted part. I would say there are scenarios where the partner doesn't have to coerce Mm -hmm. to get the sex, but it doesn't mean the sex isn't happening out of duty, which is, I think, what we covered with that. Yeah. And and we'll get there to there's a protective factor here when she's saying, wait a minute, she's right. Yeah, Yeah, we'll get there. Yeah. And Teresa Frazier is just saying, wow, thank you so much for doing this great, important research. Mm. I Yes. So, yeah. okay. So hypothesis two, check. Confirmed. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Pays. <laughs> mm-hmm. And at when, a much higher rate than you had hypothesized. Yes. That their number one is emotional consequences. Number two, there's psychological consequences. And number three was looking is we're moving forward, looking at um, the sexual and relational consequences or outcomes. And so, yeah, we believe that we'd find that women who consent to unwanted sex in their long-term relationships will report sexual and relationship distress. And so we used validated measure for this. These are really fascinating to read through. Um, I'm okay with you posting these slides if you want, if people really want to go through and look at each measure and what our sample size reported that would be amazing. I will, yeah. I will totally take you up on that. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it'd be great for you to even just read through at least some of them yeah. questions because it was especially the ones that are answered, you know, 30% and above. Yeah. Yeah. The top, and I've got them rated in frequency, but 46%, there's not much variety when we do have sex. 43%. We're not as physically affectionate as we used to be. 34, we don't hug and kiss as much as we used to. 41, I barely bother to approach my partner for sex. 40, I feel frustrated that I can't fix our sexual problems. 38, our sex is routine and predictable. 36, I do not initiate sex with my partner. 36, I feel anxious when I think about sex with my partner. 35, I wish more effort was made to fix our sexual relationship. 35, I feel guilty for letting my partner down. 34, I'm stressed about sex. 33, I'm questioning the strength of our relationship. I mean, it just goes on and on. But what we saw as the pattern for this situation, when you score all those reasons, it tells us which part of the relationship functionality is impacted. And the top was a lack of physical affection, the presence of sexual predictability, the lack of sexual initiation the presence of sexual hopelessness, the lack of a sense of sexual normalness. So it's, and the presence of sexual anxiety are all 30% and above. So, you know, this is helpful for clinicians when they come in and here a couple has, you know, very little non-sexual physical affection, really low sexual initiation, really high predictability, really high sexual anxiety. I don't know if we can call this a desire issue anymore. And so that's the relevance here of, are we this, you know, from biopsychosocial aspect, this is not um, a hormonal issue. It's not about. um... (laughs) Not a hormonal issue. I mean, I mean, not to minimize what hormones. No, no, no. 
but that's a whole different podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so we need to know how to assess what's causing what here, you know. Um, and I also felt like right at the bottom of those, like 31% said, I don't feel normal mm -hmm. when I compare myself sexually to others, which that's a huge, mm -hmm. like I am broken narrative. Mm -hmm. And then 30% were also saying that, you know, my partner and I are not talking about sex anymore. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to, I want to make sure too, that we understand this is, you know, ob for obvious reasons, very painful for the partner as well, right? To be in this. Oh, situation. for sure kind of hopeless mm -hmm. and not knowing how to solve these mm -hmm. issues. And um, there's a lot of avoidance. There's a lot of tension. So there, a lot of times the couples are kind of avoiding this topic. Also. Oh yeah. And so we're not, a, you know, and when we're looking at um, the presence of unrecognized coercion, it's often unrecognized to the person who's using that as strategy. And I'll say in my office, that's kind of coercive. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm not a bad guy. It's like, no, you're not a bad guy. Just there are so little desire discrepancy strategies that are coercion free. Of course, you're trying to talk your partner into something you want, but it's got to stop. It's having a negative impact. This is a losing strategy, right? Right, right. Yeah, it's not, it, it, yeah, it's like stopping the insanity. It's like trying to do something that's not working over and over again. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you want to read some of the quotes that came from this section? Yeah, do any stand out to you? from this? Oh, I just, you know, a very classic one, participant 19, I have no desire for sex anymore, right? Yeah. I have no desire for my partner. I mean, these, these, these feelings, like we were talking about guilt, shame, am I broken? Like talk about desire killers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this cycle of duty, sex, and resentment has killed any kind of emotional intimacy in the relationship. And participant 397, I have a strong dislike for sex. I have very little desire for my spouse. So, you know, here's participant 293, a complete shutdown of my personal sexuality, not a cessation of sexual activity, just mm -hmm. a desire or arousal. So that's a very interesting, you know, distinction there. Yeah, it's just, it's a desire killer. Uh, and then participant 163, it's gotten to the point where I feel repulsed by sex and cry almost every time after either in front of him or in the shower, it's awful. Yeah, that acquired aversion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, participant 399, I absolutely loathe having sex and have been contemplating divorce. We have nasty fights about the fact that I won't have sex with him anymore unless we get lots of help and change. And this is, this is really tricky because I oftentimes tell couples, you know, sexuality is a valid reason to wonder whether or not we want to stay in a relationship together. Again, for a lot of couples, that's not a valid reason, right? We have to stay together no matter what, especially in high demand, conservative religious backgrounds. Sex is kind of seen as like, not that, that's not really the reason why we should or shouldn't stay. But sexuality can be a very important part of people's lives. And it has to be a very difficult discussion to have. But again, most of the time you're seeing these couples about 15 to 20 years into these patterns and issues. And so a lot of these things have developed where it's not necessarily that the couple is incompatible. Right. It, there's been a lot of a lot of unnecessary tragedy along the way. Yeah, and there's a high likelihood that if we aren't looking at this, then you just get a new partner and the pattern starts over where you're using unrecognized coercion or you're not um, using sexual communication skills or you don't have non-coercive discrepancy strategies or you know, just go with a new partner and think consenting to unwanted sex is just a very normal part of the average marriage that's completely benign. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And participant 183 says, recently I told him I am done with sex and I feel so relieved, mm -hmm. right? So here's somebody trying to express a boundary and to say, you know, enough, this isn't good for me. At the same time, I feel very guilty. I feel mm -hmm. I could go on with our marriage by cultivating a supportive platonic friendship, but he is of course, extremely unhappy. And he broke out in a full body rash and hives and our marriage is very shaky over the sex issue. This is, it's, it's difficult when you're in a monogamous marriage where the expectation for sexual needs and partnership is, you know, within that relationship and, and what happens when one person says, well, this isn't something I'm interested in anymore. Mm -hmm. The other person is like, well, actually I am, you know, so yes. Mm -hmm. Welcome mm -hmm. to sex therapy. <laughs> right. <laughs> and a lot of the things that we are talking about with couples. 
Oh, so this was confirmed, you know, that women who consent to unwanted sex in their relationships have sexual distress and relationship distress due to it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Not a surprise again, but definitely again, probably at higher levels than you had anticipated. So it was in higher levels than I anticipated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then hypothesis four was about how does um, the ratio of consenting to unwanted sex versus consenting to wanted sex impact these outcomes. And what we found was we didn't say how many times you're having sex a month because that eliminates a lot of these couples. There's so much sexual avoidance happening that if we were to assume, oh, they had sex once a year, then we're not going to get their data, which is a critique I have about a lot of sexual uh, research is they'll use questions about how many times per month. And then you're erasing a large population which are sexless or low sex couples. So we didn't ask necessarily frequency with a number. We asked frequency with rare, sometimes, often, very often, allowing it to be proportional to their experience. And of course, we found that um, that consenting to unwanted sex was um, these distress markers were higher in low sex relationships, meaning um, the couples who said most of our sex is me consenting to unwanted sex. They had a higher distress outcome in all three areas. And the couples where the ratio was a little bit better, maybe 50, 50 or better. They had lower distress in the emotional, psychological, sexual area. So ratio really matters not so much frequency of how often this is happening, but how often is it happening um, in relationship to sex that is wanted in consexual. So, right. So, yeah. So, and that makes sense, right? If, mm -hmm. if you know, like 80% of the time you're super excited to have sexual encounters with your partner and 20% of the time you're showing up, maybe again, out of these ideas of, well, I should scratch somebody else's back. Um, yeah. you still have 80% of your experiences coming from a, a much more authentic, like self-determined space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, hypothesis four is confirmed that participants who reported a higher ratio of unwanted to wanted sex that correlated with higher degrees of distress, higher levels of post-traumatic cognition intensity and higher relationship and sexual distress. So, you know, yeah. that really paints a picture for us about the several levels of which this can be damaging for about, I'd say 53% of women. Um, so we're not saying all women that this happens to every woman, but this is pretty significant. Very significant. And I will just share participant one's quote here where she says, lost my strength to stand up and say no in sexual encounters with him, as well as in the larger context of life. Mm -hmm. Lost my ability to know what I really want because I've consented so many times to something I didn't want, but didn't want to say no to. So mm -hmm. this kind of people pleasing, which again is, is a theme I oftentimes see with, you know, vagina and vulva owners that come from these cultural expectations that they are to be helpmeets and caretakers and loving and kind and you know all of these kind of female stereotypes um submissive yeah. self self-sacrificing self mm -hmm. yes right that are not always well yeah are not not just not always not helpful <laughs> to how we you know negotiate our lives and 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 she's right not just in the sexual realm yeah hypothesis Suppose yeah, those first four were like really clear hypotheses. We got clear outcomes. It really painted this picture um, that we can maybe consider this kind of a syndrome, this consenting to unwanted sex syndrome, which over time leads to anxiety, avoidance, and aversion, an acquired aversion, um, which is, uh, anyway, that's a whole nother podcast, but it's an acquired aversion which I, you and I personally have had that discussion of women are coming in being like, I hate sex. I think I'm asexual. And I'm like, asexuality is totally valid. But if I've got 50% of my clients thinking they're asexual, something else is happening. Right, right, <laughs> exactly. So, and I like that acquired because usually, you know, from an asexuality perspective, we're talking about an orientation, which, 
for the most part, people kind of figure out from early stages. That doesn't necessarily mean always. We can be mm-hmm. fluid in our sexual orientation as well. That's the work of Lisa Diamond, which is great. But again, it's, it's yeah, it's this, well, if I don't like sex and I never want to have sex, that sounds like I'm asexual, but we're ignoring the context of where that developed and ignoring also the potential for reclaiming sexual desire in ways that could potentially benefit this person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, that was the first four hypotheses really we're looking at what are the outcomes of these women. And this fifth hypothesis is more the motivations, like why do we do this? So it's a little bit longer. It's a little bit more involved. Um, In the research up to this point, um, there's really like three or four researchers who've really stuck to this idea of understanding consent to unwanted sex. And the leading... um, Narrative has been that if you are consenting to unwanted sex to approach, you have an approach motivation, you're going to have a different outcome than if it's an avoidance motivation. And I wanted to see if that was necessarily true or not. Um, I believed that if it was congruent, I've got some Rogerian theorist in me. So if our internal world matched our external world, it would be the safest. So that's what we were looking at. We were looking at, is it more harmful to have an approach versus an avoidance motivation, or is it more helpful to have a congruent motivation? And um, this might be more interesting for those who are social scientists and who are um, individuals, maybe not. Um, But we did find that, you know, consenting to unwanted sex to avoid something like your husband's disappointment or that that still was found to be the most damaging, that that puts you at a higher likelihood to experience the emotional, psychological, sexual, and relational distress, um, side effects, symptoms. Meaning the main reason that you would agree to this in your own kind of inner cognition was to avoid disappointing your partner. Yeah. So we use the reasons for consenting to unwanted sex scale here. And, you know, 75% said, I felt it was necessary to satisfy my partner's needs. That's an avoidance motivation. It's not an approach motivation. An approach motivation was coded as something like, um, uh, da, 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 like, um, see it's, it didn't even show up until like the 14th item on the scale. <laughs> um, I wanted, oh, see, 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 um, I wanted to feel closer to my partner was a good example, but those didn't even show up. I mean, the top 10 reasons of why these women all consented to unwanted sex was to avoid hurting their partner's feelings, to avoid tension in the relationship, to, um, avoid their partner feeling rejected, um, they're like all avoidance. And those were the reasons that were most correlated with having the high distress and the high PTSD symptoms. Yeah. I felt I'd be jeopardizing the relationship if I didn't engage. I felt that I needed to, because I had consented before. Mm -hmm. I wanted to feel accepted by my partner. Mm -hmm. These are all very real reasons, you know, real relational reasons why it's always kind of like that me versus we, right? Like, what Mm -hmm. do I need versus what do I think the relationship needs? And if this relationship matters to me, then I'm willing to sacrifice aspects of myself for the relationship. Mm -hmm. Some of this is normal. Some of this is necessary for all relationships. A lot of it is very harmful. Yeah. And so, you know, that hypothesis was, we came out saying, okay, it's complicated. The congruence of your internal world with your external world fell right in the middle between avoidance and approach motivation. So it's like, okay, maybe this is a both and, but consenting to avoid something is still the most harmful or it's going to lead to that distress we listed out in hypothesis one through four. So, you know, some of these quotes, you know, are highly relatable, but also so painful of, you know, I believed that I needed to manage my partner through sex and that had many negative outcomes. I wasn't being honest with myself and I didn't want to hurt him. I believe it does cause trauma to ignore how you're honestly feeling and consent to unwanted sex. Um, Participant 36, I felt angry and frustrated that I didn't want sex, but I had to pretend so, so that he wouldn't be upset. 
you know, kind of nods at this, the damage that self decept uh, you know, self-deception or not honoring our internal voice, how that can play out long-term in a relationship. Well, and I think participant 24 hits a whole nother difficulty again in high demand and conservative religions, oftentimes a female is encouraged to stay at home, raise the children, be the homemaker. And so this person says, I don't feel like I can make it on my own financially. So I stay in the relationship and have sex to keep him in it. I think sub either whether it's subconscious or conscious, this is affecting many, many heterosexual marriages uh, where there is a, a, a divide in economic power. And that's something that I don't think we're addressing at any level that should be addressed in our society. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you feel like your livelihood is dependent on the relationship sticking together and your children's livelihood, that's a lot of pressure, whether you recognize it consciously or not. Mm -hmm. And the glue being sex, that they'll stay in it as long as you're providing sex. Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, it was about this time when we said, wait a minute, Lisa Diamond was on my committee and we were both like, wait a minute, minute. because we were looking at the responses in people's own words. We're showing us something differently. The kind of the qualitative assessments weren't really showing us, um, which was, I, maybe the word avoidance isn't the right word here. You know, we've got all when we're looking at why people consented to unwanted sex, it was because they thought they would jeopardize the relationship if they didn't, or they had guilt for not participating, or they feared they'd lose their partner, or they wanted to avoid tension. And this painted the picture that every single sexual encounter is now very high stakes for these relationships, that sex is how these women are keeping their safety. And that's why it's causing trauma, even when it's not coercive, because we were looking at that coercion scale saying, wait, the trauma is happening with and without coercion. So it's not necessarily the coercion. Coercion is traumatic. We know that we have all the data in the world. And <laughs> sometimes when there's not coercion, there's still this experience of sexual trauma that looks like sexual avoidance, sexual anxiety, sexual aversion that's acquired. Maybe saying it's because they're avoiding tension isn't really that helpful, maybe it's they're trying to maintain social safety. And then that sent me in a whole rabbit hole of all the science and research about social safety, um, which, you know, the, the research about social safety is challenging kind of what we think about social anxiety, saying that as humans, we don't enter a social situations and then we're assume we're safe until we have a negative encounter. And then we're like, oh, I'm unsafe. That, um, evolutionarily how we developed was entering a social situation saying assuming we're not safe until we get enough encounters that tell us that we're safe and that the hypervigilance is normal and it goes down when we get the confirmation that we are safe here you know will these people fight a buffalo for me will they with me you know will these people um help me survive because we knew that our survival depends on safety in the in-group and in our day-to-day, -day, that is often the relationship or the marriage. Is This is the in-group that provides my financial security, my social security. And um, that these women have created a losing strategy to keep their social safety. As I will fall on the sword sexually so that I can maintain my marriage. And maybe we got messages that that was the right thing to do. Um, but here we are two decades into the relationship and it is backfiring. I'm having some major symptoms and some major side effects from this losing strategy, you know, and women didn't, when we look at the emotional outcomes, they didn't mark fear, but they marked words that are rooted in fear. So that I brought up this emotional wheel as they would say, I'm not scared. But if you look at like the emotion wheel, things that come out of fear are anxious, uncomfortable, high alert, um, all the things that they actually did mark. And so being able to say, it's not that it's unsafe because I'm scared I'm going to get hit or I'm being physically held, but it's, I'm socially unsafe. There will be consequences if I'm honest about how I feel about sex tonight. And that that is the losing strategy 
is we've developed this idea of consenting to unwanted sex to avoid the fact that we don't feel like we can be honest tonight about how we have feel about the sexual proposition without there being consequences that will jeopardize my social safety. Yes, and you said that all so well. Something that kind of goes along with this, there's a comment from Dan Hardy saying sex alone isn't enough to keep a guy in a marriage. You know, and I think mm-hmm. what he's implying there is that oftentimes these things get very binary kind yeah. of, thing, you know, and again, they're, I think, fueled by a lot of these kind of binary gender roles. You're know, like, men want sex and women want emotions, right? <laughs> and, and it's like, no, like, you know, when I get, when I talk to a lot of the men in these, in these kind of relationships, they're saying, I want to feel loved. I want to feel wanted. I want to feel desired. You know, I want to feel like I matter. You know, I want to feel like Mm -hmm. she's turned on by me. Right. It's not just, Mm -hmm. oh, I want to stick my penis, you know, somewhere. Um, Mm -hmm. It's, it's a much more emotional connective thing that does tie to physical intimacy. And so I think the social safety thing that you're mentioning ties into that as far as, how do we how do we know that 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 both of us are in a space where we feel that that teamwork that congruency of togetherness right that partnership mm-hmm. and, um, yeah yeah that can be really hard I love Lisa Diamond when she talks about social safety it's like we're all born right right off the bat right like the the birth canal is like traumatic you know, everybody's screaming as they come into the world you know? life is scary <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I just went through a freaking traumatic experience. Who's going to help me out here, right? And so right from the get-go, it, it isn't safe, you know? And so I think that's a really interesting perspective that we're not returning to some safety. Now, we've never been safe, but we're trying to gain safety. Yeah. And the more we're able to do that, the better off we seem to be, so. Yeah, and, you know, my research isn't saying all this happens for all women, right? It was about 53% that there's a certain degree of women who don't experience this this way. And so we, we have to take that in account. You know, we, we had this light bulb moment because I believed that the research was going to paint this picture that in order to be benign or positive, sex needed to be both wanted and conceptual consensual the both needed to be at play and this research pointed out a few more factors because there were women who wanted to have sex and who consented to have sex and were still having some of these symptoms and it's painting the picture that we also need to have confidence that our sexual honesty will not threaten our social safety Mm. and that's another level of what's needed for sex to at least not be harmful to be at least benign and at most enjoyable, is this confidence that our sexual honesty is not going to threaten the social safety of the relationship. And so um, I love that. That goes right along with what I I talk about a lot about a term I came up with, which is protective intimacy. mm -hmm. It's kind of like we're taught in these systems that you're to protect each other. Mm -hmm. Don't hurt your wives be kind to your husbands, right? Mm-hmm. And so we're all being so kind and polite that we can't really show up because mm-hmm. there's, there's going to be honest aspects of ourselves that will disappoint our partner, that will not be exactly what our partner wanted, especially sexually. And if we don't have the skills and the resilience to really sit at a table where we can discuss those things, which of course we don't because nobody's ever role modeled or taught these nope. these to us, then we really suffer. And so we think we're being intimate and kind by, by accommodating instead of showing up honestly, Mm -hmm. which is what we really need in order to desire to thrive. Yeah. Yeah. And in, you know, putting that into some of the participants words, you know, participant 100 said it was my job to please him and not pleasing him would put me in a dangerous position or participant 24 for years I thought and was told by my therapist that there might be something wrong with me and that he would leave if I didn't help meet his needs Um, 28 you know I worry that if I say no too often that he won't be satisfied in the relationship so there's all this anxiety about what our honesty will mean Um, and it turns it into a transactional encounter instead of a intimate negotiation yeah And, you know, what we determined through this research was that there is a protective factor. We are not talking about women who have a responsive desire style, women who, when, you know, a sexual encounter comes up and they're not really feeling it, 
But as they start to engage, the desire shows up and they want to be there and they're having a good time. And so during and after they're having positive emotional experiences, they're having positive psychological experiences, and they're having positive emotional and sexual experiences. Those are not these women. That is a protective factor. If you have a responsive desire style, um, this is this is not what's happening for you. But women who before, during, and after they consent to the unwanted sex, they have a negative emotional experience. They have some PTSD-like symptoms, and they have distress about their sexuality and the sexual relationship. That is who we are talking about. Um, this is- you know, and I, I, I want to know more about responsive desire that comes from Bassan's model, who Emily mm-hmm. Nagoski speaks about a lot in Come As You Are, which is an excellent book. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of that idea of can we think about responsive desire as a strategy or, or a way to frame our, our thinking, but again, um, doesn't always work. <laughs> it doesn't, it, it, if you're not coming at it from that space, it's not necessarily helpful. Yeah. So, so I want to avoid the directionality of the conclusion. Instead of saying, if you consent to unwanted sex, you will have these negative outcomes. Rather thinking about if you have some of these negative outcomes, it might be rooted in the fact that you're consenting to unwanted sex. Um, that that directionality matters um, when we are trying to have like an ethical, biopsychosocial assessment of how did we get here. Love it. All right. Do you want to hit hypothesis six? Yeah. So this was, okay. What about demographic factors? Uh, Race, culture, religion, relationship length, education level. This sample was really homogeneous. I had highly educated women who'd been in a relationship for decades, who were mostly white, straight, um, and mostly religious at some point in their life. And so in 2023, I I am repeating this research with the goal of having a more diverse demographic so that we can know with certainty, is this a white educated Christian woman phenomenon, or is this um, generalizable to most women? So there was no demographic that stood out except for those who stayed religious and those who had left religion. So I did ask, how were you raised? And I'd asked, where are you at now as far as religion goes? And I did ask about um, certain different sects, um, but there was a slightly, and it was a statistically significant, but it was slightly elevated experience of those who left religion had higher um, negative outcomes. And I've got a couple hypotheses for those possible causes. One possible cause could be that the religious or the sexual ethic didn't work for these individuals, that they recognized it was problematic, that they recognized some of these issues were rooted in sexual submission or shame or purity, obsession or demonizing pleasure. Um, That is a high reason. That is a fairly common cause that's part of many individuals' faith crisis. Sexually, the ethic is not healthy or helpful. That could be one reason that they left. That was part of the reasons they left was the sexual distress. Um, Another reason could be, you know, Leek and Fish uh, back in the 90s had this theory that most people, whether subconsciously or unconsciously, they represent their in-group more favorably than it actually is. That the individuals who stayed religious might they attribute everything as positive if it's going to reflect on the institution mm-hmm. so those right. are two of my uh, my you know i'm not sure why this is showing up here's two reasons why it might be um but the only demographic thing that matt that seemed to matter was uh religiously rooted right yeah i think as people oftentimes leave their cultural kind of uh, frameworks, they're oftentimes more open to seeing how those cultural frameworks could have harmed them or already felt like you're saying already felt harmed by them. And so they're more, you know, have more recognition of that. Whereas yes, when you're in the in-group, it's harder to be as conscious mm-hmm. about some of those things and, or you are defending some of those things because yeah. it's part of your belief system. Yeah. So, yeah. It's interesting. We have some participants who say, 
uh, like 159 says, I don't blame him. I blame our religious upbringing. He never learned to ask for consent and I never learned I had the right over my own body. That's pretty profound, right? And then participant 275 says, I feel like our religious upbringing has made him feel like I'm the only way to satisfy his sexual desires. And that puts undue mm-hmm. stress on me. And again, many of these high demand conservative religions, you know, they, they forbid masturbation, they forbid sexual media, they forbid, of course, you know, non-monogamy or, you know, other, other options, even fantasy, sexual fantasy. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's not a whole lot of options necessarily other than, oh, you are my partner. You are my sexual outlet. You are the one that's supposed to provide that for me. Right. And so, and I think that can go for regardless of who the high libido partner is, but yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's to be determined. Sounds like hypothesis six. Yeah. We're going to rerun the research. Um, hoping to get a more stratified demographic and see how that impacts our conclusions. But this was strong enough that the sample size was large enough and the findings were significant enough that, you know, I and my dissertation committee feel fairly confident in proposing this syndrome of consenting to unwanted sex trauma, this kind of sexual traumatic syndrome. And you know, how you would characterize it is there's emotional distress before, during, or after a sexual encounter, the presence of sexual resentment, sexual guilt, sexual inadequacy, that those emotional outcomes are present. Second criteria are, you know, they're scoring moderate to, on a moderate to high level of situationally based post-traumatic symptoms, mostly being avoidance, aversion, and anxiety that, that our client is experiencing these psychological outcomes. And then the third criteria, that there's a low sexual frequency, that there's sexual arguments, that there's a decrease in sexual female sexual desire, that there's low sexual satisfaction, um, that they've, they're showing a presence of these sexual relationship outcomes, that all three of these together look like sexual trauma. And these women were not victimized, assaulted, or abused, that The context was consensual and it was harmful, even if there was the presence of coercion or not. And um, so for me, this gave me a name for what I see on my couch so often. It gave me a new um, way of looking at where we start with these individuals. If we're going to start with a sexual trauma lens rather than a desire lens, I'm hoping we have much better outcomes because Sensate Focus has really low anecdotal outcome for me <laughs> with and other clinicians that I talk to. No, correct. <laughs> so this does have treatment implication because you end with your slide saying consent is not enough. And mm-hmm. I think oftentimes when a couple who's who's struggling with these issues, they show up in my office and 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 in, in this scenario, in this, in this study, for example, the husband's like, okay, hooray, we're going to sex therapy. Woohoo, we're finally going to do something about this. And the wife is kind of like hesitant. And why is that? Because the wife is expecting the sex therapist to give them assignments, to give them work, to give them sexual exercises. And we're reinforcing them to ignore what they don't want to do and do it anyway, because now I'm the authority, not the husband. (laughs) So it's, it's not going to work. We're reinforcing to consent to unwanted something. Yeah, exactly. So giving sensate focus exercises or giving any type of exercise that now you're saying, here's yet another thing you have to do. To you need better- to consent to this, even yep. though you don't want it. Mm-hmm. It just exacerbates the problem. And so I think a lot of times in my practice, husbands are initially very shocked at some of my treatment protocols, which is <laughs> we are, we're not, we're not going to touch sex with a 10 foot pole and we're going to do a lot of repair work. We're going to do mm-hmm. a lot of establishing, like you're saying, social and sexual safety. We're going to treat trauma. We're going to, you know, really look at both of your perspectives so that if there is a chance, because sometimes trauma, you know, it's so pronounced that sometimes you really have to even wonder if this is going to be able to be repaired, but when there is chances for repair, that's going to be after a lot of work. Um, And then maybe we can get back, you know, we can get to discovering sexual self and introducing you know, coupled sexuality, and you called it consequence-free coupled sexuality. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Ding, 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 ding. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. That's where pleasure and joy can thrive. (laughs) 
<laughs> so, and mm-hmm. orgasm and all the fun, juicy things. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Cammie, this has been incredible. I know that you have to run for time's sake, but any last comments you want to make? I'm just so incredibly proud of the work that you've done here. I'm just thrilled that you've, you've put this all together in such a succinct way. I think this will have huge implications for both therapists and for individuals and couples, you know, that hopefully will get access to a lot of this information. Yeah. I just want, I want to thank you. And I want to thank your listeners because I, I really strongly believe I would have not gotten the sample size that I did if you hadn't have allowed me to share your platform and you hadn't gifted me your reach in such a generous way. I appreciate that about you as a colleague. And I want to thank your listeners who showed up in droves 1300 of them to participate in the survey. Now they all didn't come from this, but I do think that it was really influential that the reach was really massive. And, um, you know, we need to know these things about how to maintain a sexually satisfying and sustainable relationship throughout the lifespan. And this is one thing that whether it's a religion or whether it's Dr. Laura, anybody saying you've got to have sex because um, it's your duty or sex is like the dishes. You just got to get it done. Like these messages, whether they're coming from religious sources or from cultural sources are really, really impacting women and creating low desire. And we're always looking for how do we treat women's low desire? Let's develop a pill. Let's develop a strategy. Let's develop. And without knowing exactly where the low desire is coming from, we're not going to be treating it effectively. And so that was my real goal. I'm really proud of it. I'm really, really grateful to you personally and your listeners. And just thrilled that after a year of really hard work, I have something I'm proud to show, something I'm going to continue working on. So. I'm grateful to you and your listeners. No, thank you. It's amazing. And again, I hope that couples, as they listen to this, it's not about demonizing anybody. No, 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 no. The husband or the wife, these are very real, valid reasons for you to be in very painful, difficult spaces. I really like to put a lot of systemic blame out there, this, right? Yes, so much systemic blame. All the systemic yes, blame. All the systemic blame. Uh, I think these are usually very well-intentioned, loving couples that really, you know, had all the hopes and, and desires like, like most people do as they get married and, and just a lot of things that, that are unfortunately not, we're just not skilled at. So let's use information when we know better, we can do better, right? That's Maya Angelou. And um, thank you, Cammie. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you for your enthusiasm. This was like a baby shower for me. Your enthusiasm (laughs) about my work feels a little bit like a baby shower. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Cammie, have a great weekend. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Natasha Helfer podcast. To help keep this podcast going, please consider donating at natashahelfer.com and share this episode. You can find Natasha on Facebook at Natasha Helfer, LCMFT, CSTS, and at Natasha Helfer MFT on Instagram and TikTok. You can find all her cool resources at natashahelfer.com. The intro and outro music for this episode is by Otter Creek. This podcast was edited by Ashley Pacini. There is a place where time slows to nature's pace, and there is space there to find yourself in her embrace some places should be left alone so we can always go to the homeland of the heart the home.